So this is going to be about how you would go about breaking apart Russia and stopping the Ukraine war if you were actually serious about doing so. As opposed to what you've probably heard from a lot of pro-Russian commentators, which are all over YouTube, and actually Russians are still on YouTube because it hasn't been restricted, probably for propaganda reasons. You have a lot of people saying that the America is at war with Russia to preserve, to promote regime change within the Russian Federation. Biden even had a gaffe where he said, uh, we have to change the regime of Russia, but we are not. Uh, as far as I can tell, engaged in the business of doing so. What we're doing instead in this Ukraine situation is a series of half measures, which is not accomplishing anything in terms of a decisive Ukrainian victory. We're only giving them enough material and weapons and support to allow them to fight off the Russians without actually retaking their territory because we're afraid that Russia's strategic nuclear arsenal will be used against the United States. I actually believe, and this is my belief, this is a hunch, this isn't based on any expert knowledge, but my hunch about that strategic nuclear arsenal is that it is no more functional than their tank force. Because if you have a force that is selling high-end components off of their tanks, and falsifying training records for its Air Force to inflate the amount of flight time and combat training hours in order that people can just sign off on something and not have to do anything, there's no reason to assume that isn't also happening to its nuclear weapons stockpile. So, regardless of... And, and nuclear weapons, ICBMs of all stripes, require upkeep. They're not just a, a weapon system like an artillery shell that you can store somewhere. Uh, endlessly, uh, even decommissioned nuclear weapons require some amount of high-end maintenance. So I don't think that Russian rocketry is going to be uh, very uh, effective. There are people who have it all fucked up and think that Russians have, you know, a great uh, rocket force and great strategic force, and I just don't think that that is the huge deterrent that people think it is. Another problem with the Russian rhetoric that we're seeing, I'm just going to look at the map here. So, here's your business area, right? Well, now we got to back up again because we're all the way in Kazakhstan. So, supposedly, uh, well, Russia and Belarus have this union state arrangement where they are uh, merging. I would expect that if Lukashenko was overthrown or died, they would try to absorb it as a province outright. Supposedly, the comparison that I've heard most recently on Gonzalo Lira's debate with Laserpig was that this is comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis in that NATO is on the doorstep of Ukraine even though NATO does not have nuclear weapons in any of these countries here. Um, has them in Germany, under Germany and Italy, and Turkey, under certain arrangements. It's basically a weapon-sharing arrangement where they have access to the arsenal. But it's not in Poland. Poland has asked for them and not gotten them. Uh, that's something we should do. We should definitely deploy nuclear weapons in Poland. I know that's threatening, but again, we need to respond as an alliance, NATO needs to respond to provocations that the Russians are going about. It needs to respond to those appropriately. And part of that response would be deploying nuclear weapons in that area um, as a threat. So, supposedly, NATO expanding into Ukraine. I went on a tangent. NATO responding uh, in Ukraine. Ukraine asking to be part of... Uh, being part of the Partnership for Peace, which is like possibly going to join, be be considered to be part of NATO, it's, et cetera, and so on. Supposedly, that's equal to Russian missiles being put in Cuba. It's not, because there's no nuclear weapons going into Ukraine. Ukraine is not a member of the alliance. That's nonsense. So, first of all, if NATO was this huge, actual huge threat, um, anything more than this propaganda 
chimera that they've dreamed up. Why would Putin start a war here, pulling away his troops from this common border with NATO, NATO the NATO alliance here? Uh, the war then causes Sweden and Finland to at least ask to join NATO officially, ending uh, Finland's unspoken bargain, at least with the Soviet Union, where it was uh, a non-aligned power. So, why would you do that if NATO is a huge threat to Russia? And, of course, the answer is that it's not. Never has been. There's never been an aggressive action from NATO towards Russia in terms of a, a conventional military conflict, or even a non-conventional one. Um, even now, there have been, uh, you know, expansions toward its border, which it has protested. Uh, there have been all kinds of accusations about a promise not to expand. It's past that point where that needs to even continue to be discussed. Um, if Russia wanted a diplomatic rapprochement with the United States, the way to accomplish that was to do that, uh, not to invade and seize territory, which it would, it, it surely had to have known on some level would make it international pariah, if not a rogue state. It's now in the rogue state category like North Korea. So, looking at the map, how would you fix this situation? The first thing you want to do, okay, <clears throat> long, massive front line, by the way, uh, as long as any, as lo a lot of the major fronts in World War II, nearly as long as the Eastern Front. It was as long as the Eastern Front when they were trying to take Kiev, um, meaning the Eastern Front World War II. You would definitely give Ukraine long, long, long range missiles. You would do that immediately. You would give them fighter jets, and you would give them tanks. Uh, fortunately, we do have a lot of MT Bradleys. They are on the way. We do have M1s. We gave M1s to Saudi Arabia. Right, Saudi Arabia is a shit a country that contributed to 9-11, and we gave them M1s, and now we're afraid to give them to the Ukrainians because supposedly Russia is going to escalate the war. How? How is Russia going to possibly respond to this? I, I don't see a danger in that. If you look at the balance of forces between NATO and Russia, no contest. A war between Russia and NATO will be over in like 72 hours. Um, I'm not convinced they would go to nuclear war because we give them tanks. You know, we give the Ukrainians tanks. We have plenty of M1s that we honestly as a country, as the United States, we're never going to use. Uh, there's never going to be a... The only place where you're going to see a massive tank war uh, with any possible United States adversaries is on this North European plane here. Okay? And that's out the window. The Russian tank force has been gutted. They're pulling T-62s out of storage. And um, T-55s, in the case of the LPR troops um, and DNR troops. So, or DPR troops. So, there's no point in us hoarding those. If you fight a war with Iran or China or against some, whatever the next Salafi terrorist group network is going to be, you're not going to do it using M1 tanks. You're just not. It's not how it's going to go. Uh, you're talking about naval air wars, not massive armored battles. I'm sorry. So, I see no reason why you wouldn't just give these tanks to the Ukrainians who would make better use of them than the U.S. Uh, because they're literally just sitting in storage uh, that we're, we're not using. So, likewise, uh, we could be providing them a lot more artillery. And the way you do this, so you've seen Poland make moves to do this, right? And there's a, uh, but the way you ultimately do this is you start thinking outside the box. You start thinking about this area, the Indo-Pacific. India and Vietnam are natural allies of the United States in this uh, 
coming conflict with China, coming cold war with China. And they have a lot of Russian equipment. Another way we could do this is we could sell American equipment to India and Vietnam, in turn take some of their T-72s and Russian equipment and get it over to Ukraine. Uh, likewise, countries like Indonesia, I mean, there's a lot of different areas that have Soviet-era equipment. I've already spoken about the need to put pressure on North Korea to, to uh, mess with them because they are helping the Russians, and it, it would always it's always a good idea to keep them on their toes. And then ultimately, you want to deal with the Chinese, okay? What you want to do is get the Chinese to some negotiating table. Tell them that we, and this doesn't mean I would necessarily support this, but uh, we want to at least give China the option of a diplomatic solution to Taiwan. Get them talking to the Taiwanese about a, a one country, two system solution. Put that on the table. Say, uh, let's start a trade deal between all these Central Asian former Soviet states and China and include the United States as a partner, right? to get them out of the Russian orbit and into the Chinese orbit, right? Uh, this would hurt Russia massively. Now, one of the other things you can do, uh, I, I, the next portion you're going to want to think about is possibly aggressive action against Russia. And I would say the off-ramp for Putin would have to be a return to the February borders with Ukraine. Uh, you, Russia has talked about wanting to begin SALT uh, negotiations for SALT three, strategic arms limitation. We would want to engage in that, absolutely. And I ultimately think that if you look at some of these... Uh, areas like Kaliningrad, you probably want to put pressure on them. And if you really wanted to be uh, flippant, you could have a referendum in Kaliningrad to join Poland. I mean, that's basically what you're going to have to do. Uh, I would be training proxy forces for deployment into Belarus uh, to start a guerrilla war there. In addition, you have Chechnya, okay? I would be taking... We've got some detainees somewhere, right? So I would take some Gitmo detainees and uh, I would be using them as double agents. And let's say we have forces in Syria, Free Syrian Army, Iraq, send them to Chechnya to restart the jihad there. Uh, since one of his major supporters is the Chechen president, that would tie that down very nicely. And uh, ultimately with China, I would probably also do the same thing to the uh, Uyghur areas. Carrot and stick, doing things to mess with them at the same time, negotiating. I mean, that's ultimately how foreign policy has to be run. Looking at this border, uh, this has always been problematic this DMZ I, I would move it up you know up here uh, so that would be if I was holding war games that would be what I would threaten to do so there are a series of things that we're not doing to pressure the Russians to uh, lose the war uh, you could easily so if Iran is supporting them then I would uh, tell Israel they can bomb the Iranian nuclear program and I would ferment revolution in the Khuzestan area here. There's an ethnic Arab population. There's been an insurgency there. I would continue to support that in order to pressure Iran. I would be arming Taiwan to the teeth also. Um, I would extend the nuclear guarantee to South Korea and Taiwan. So, not just Japan, but I would extend the nuclear umbrella to those countries. So, prevent uh, 
this would make it a, a serious business for anybody to launch any kind of nuclear attacks on them. But anything, if we learn from the war, Taiwan would need a lot of anti-ship missiles. So make it clear that if war comes here like it did to Ukraine, it would be very costly. And this would be building the infrastructure for a new a new international arrangement, okay? Where you would not have authoritarian China, Russia, and Iran, and North Korea screwing with the international system. And the end goal would be uh, world peace, you know, through uh, through these actions. Then the sector sector you really have to worry about is energy, and you would solve that pretty easily. You would solve that by funding nuclear plants as many as you can within the United States. You would lift sanctions on Venezuela. That needs to be done already. I mean, it's not doing much in terms of hurting them, and I would I would at least be arguing for an aid package for hydrogen fuel research within the U.S. Uh, R&D complex. So that's ultimately how you deal with the Russians, okay? You open diplomatic avenues for them to get out of Ukraine. It has to be clear that they have to get back to the February borders. And um, as a guarantee, we can say, yeah, the Ukrainians won't take X, Y, and Z, but we can't really make that determination for them. But you need to give Ukraine enough offensive weapons to do that. They clearly can win operationally. Right now you have each side trading operational level victories, and it's making for a strategic stalemate. And that needs to be broken, and this is how you do it.